Hey everybody, if you are interested in Star Wars and the old school Battlefront games, then please take a look at my new Battlefront Max channel which you can find in the description down below. Every two days I upload a new review of an awesome map or mod for this timeless classic and provide links so you can immediately pick up and play. Hopefully see you there on the channel and also don't forget to take a look at some of my other channels like the Kanoa Reviews channel where I review games both old and new and where you can even send in suggestions or requests on games that I will review. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the episode. With Britain having set in motion a turn of events that might be seen in other countries as well with the British Security Act, the Soviets kept awfully quiet as Juganov pulled a curtain in front of its government by focusing on industrial advancements. But the people did not anticipate Juganov to do anything about the Brits as they got their growing criticism with the act itself that now needed to be silenced by its government. Instead, they thought Juganov would look towards China that was going its own way, or some parts of America that were now more vulnerable than ever. Angela Davis's UAPR was still struggling with the war against Cascadia after so many months had passed. It went on for so long that she grew desperate and initialized a program to support population growth for future generations to come after the war had been subsided. At the end of 2011, news came out from Chomsky's corner. President Chomsky had addressed an enormous crowd outside Philadelphia's Capitol building, immediately after the signing of a new constitution for the Commonwealth. In his speech, the longtime commander-in-chief declared a new beginning for this still young nation, proclaiming an anarcho-syndicalist federation based on its principles and the ideals of a new revolutionary central committee. Upon hearing these words, the millions gathered roared in support, preceded by an overwhelming rendition of Varsavyanka, a spontaneous display of unity that had resonated across the nation. Finally, Noam Chomsky's dream of an anarcho-syndicalist America had been realized, and for the people, their Philadelphia constitution was a beacon of hope in an ever ominous world. All the while, Canada still continued doing its own thing in the North. It almost mocked the split Americas beneath it with its Spirit of Freedom campaign. In the UK, not too much was happening. Minor reforms were being pushed through to improve the country's economic situation. People knew that behind the curtains, important moves were probably being made, but those would have to wait until being presented to the light of day. A month later, however, all of Britain was on his or her feet to celebrate Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee. The Diamond Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II was a multinational celebration throughout 2012 that marked the 60th anniversary of the ascension of the Queen on 6th of February 1952. The Queen was regent of various states across the world and of course the United Kingdom. The only other time in British history that a monarch celebrated a Diamond Jubilee was in 1897, when Queen Victoria celebrated hers. Commemorative events were held throughout former Commonwealth nations, but unlike the Queen's previous jubilees, Elizabeth II and her husband only toured the United Kingdom. And then the mere month later, somber news arrived once again from Chomsky's corner for one last time. The failure to pass the American Healthcare Act had ensured that Noam Chomsky would remain at the bottom of every required list, ruling a possible transplant out for the next few months, and time was not an ally of the aging president. Doctors were unable to perform an immediate surgery when the commander-in-chief arrived at their hospital, leaving the country waiting in fear. Eventually, after almost a week, a spokesperson from the hospital came out to meet with tired media in the dead of night to confirm that he suffered a fatal heart attack hours before. President Noam Chomsky had died, failing to avoid the inevitable. Had the American healthcare been legislated, it was almost certain that he would have received the necessary medical care. At least some found closure that mere weeks before his passing, Chomsky achieved his dream of realizing the anarcho-syndicalist nation 
in which he spent the last of his days. But the question now of course was, which turn the nation would now head towards with Chomsky no longer at the steering wheel? A lot was possible here and opportunities were plentiful for those who dared. Donald Rumsfeld to the south felt that with the fall of Chomsky, things could escalate with Davis to the west. He hoped that the next one in line continued the path that was set by Chomsky to begin with. In response, the Soviet Union called upon protection of their allies. It was a vague term they threw into the world, but it was to ensure communist support would continue to thrive throughout both Asia and America as once again opportunity presented itself with Chomsky gone and Davis waging war in the West. China continued its way for befriending many nations including now the Congo, purely for long-term reasoning for if the world would explode. If this were to occur, one's true friends could sometimes be counted on only one hand. The UK then unleashed what they said was a new industrial revolution, but this was more bark than bite. In reality, they had started to invest more in technology back in 2010, and with this self-labeled revolution, they wanted to reinforce the British Security Act all the more and give the government through that more power as well. In the Middle East, where turmoil was always brewing, another conflict broke out. People had been fighting on these grounds for thousands of years, making the sand soaked with blood, and this war would just be another number in most people's eyes. This did increase the amount of conflicts going on in the world to two again. Some people thought that the world was doing very well, since there were those who believed the Soviet Union would drown the world in another world war. But instead, Juganov started the Aid for Africa campaign, where help would be sent to different parts to help with the famine, drought and economic situation. But in reality, agents were sent in as well with the task of unleashing communist revolutions here and there so that Juganov's influence could spread without him lifting a finger and keeping his clean record. India continued to make its country ready and open the doors for the Soviet Union. After agreeing to the Soviet loan, now they were trying to abolish the license Raj. This would put the country a bit closer to chaos, but production growth would rise staggeringly. Those at the top of the factories were very pleased. China then finally hit a stream of military direction, as it promoted military cooperation to many nations it had befriended over the past few years. It wanted world leaders to know they could count on China, creating an image of relief, but one that could only be a theatrical display on China's behalf. Janet Beale stood now at the head of the Federation of American Syndicates, which she had inherited from Chomsky. She issued for social unity, as that was one of the first things that needed to settle down after the country had lost their former president. By the end of May 2012, the Syrian Socialist Republic was victorious over the kingdom as the dust was settling on the sand once more. It was only a matter of time before a new conflict arose. In the meantime, the UK continued its technological crusade as it now invested heavily on automation technology, something that could be very dangerous if implemented with the BSA since any form of humanity would be driven out of the process. And by now, the Cascadian Revolution Wars against the UAPR never seemed to end. Tens of thousands had died on both sides and had ever been going on for so long, it was now considered one of the bloodiest conflicts in the history of America. The resilience of the revolutionary fighters was staggering, as they were so much fewer, but more effective in every way. The UAPR hauled in more victories in total, but the Cascadians made them pay dearly for it. The communist-controlled United Dutch Republic and Belgium were acting as the Soviet Union's watchdogs, rather than Germany and France that were its work dogs. Both the Dutch and the Belgians focused on military aid but this was but a drop in the ocean for the mighty Red Army. In August of 2012, the world could finally forget about all the negativity and fear of another potential all-out war with the Summer Olympics. The capital of the most powerful nation on Earth was ready to showcase its grandiose new design in spectacular fashion. The most anticipated sporting event of the past decade, perhaps even longer, would supposedly be the most extravagant in Olympic history. 
with no boycotts to be seen this time around. As the athletes prepared themselves, the media tuned in and the hammer and sickle was once again raised above all other world flags. Each nation held its breath, hoping to come out on top. In more ways than one, this sporting event represented how some political leaders viewed the world's current position and could not wait to tear the Soviet flag to pieces.